Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. Joining me tonight is my co-host, uh, John Strobel and uh, Gerald Riggins, and we're going to be talking to uh, Michael Hobart uh, Edwards the author of Speaking to the Dead with Radios, and he's got an interesting book he's going to tell us about tonight in which he's cataloged a lot of information in which um, the history of these uh, ghost boxes as well as the uh, the old recorder type message uh, where you didn't do it in real time. And, and the ones that he likes to talk about mainly, you can actually have an interactive conversation with the uh, deceased and actually even call people you know that are deceased to talk to you in real time. And he's got a lot of information in here about how these devices got started, who did it, um, the whole entire history of them. He goes into um, a lot of uh, methods he uses for uh, the actual recording and the different kind of ways he does his recording. Uh, it's a big book. It's plum full of information. It's informative. Uh, I personally would highly recommend it to anybody as a guide to get them started and doing this particular type of research, uh, it's a wonderful place to start. And he also lists a lot of his personal experiences in here. But if I tell you all too much, there won't be nothing left for him to tell you. So, without further ado, why don't we introduce um, him real quick like. So, Michael, how you doing tonight? Pretty good. How you guys doing? Uh, we're doing just great over here. John and... Uh, Gerald, I want to thank you two guys for joining us again tonight. Yeah, no problem. Not a problem at all, Royce. Happy to be here. Now, real quick, like, why don't we uh, get Michael off and let him t- uh, tell everybody a little something about himself and why it was, what led him to write this particular book. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, <laughs> as you heard, my name is Michael Hubbard Edwards. Uh, i uh, from Cary, North Carolina. I work for IBM uh, and asset manager at IBM, and um, I got into uh, what's called uh, uh, using radios to communicate with the dead, radio sweep, electronic voice phenomena. It's quite a bit different than just using the recorder only, where you you know turn a recorder on and just start asking questions, but then you don't hear anything until later on playback. Uh, with radio sweep, you can actually often hear the dead communicating to you during the recording session, and then you can interact with them and talk back to them. Um, actually got started in this uh, I, for many years after my father died in 1987, Hobart Colin Edwards. Um, I had tried to, you know, go into psychics, you know, like everybody else wanted to communicate with our loved ones and mediums and so forth, um, just trying to find a way to make contact, even reading uh, many different books on how to improve my psychic abilities or become a medium or what have you. And um, I, uh, in 2007, late 2007, I happened upon a book by a respected occult writer, Konstantinos, and he wrote a book called Speak with the Dead. <clears throat> and in his book, he talked about the various ways, you know, you could learn how to communicate with the dead um, through, you know, your psychic abilities, medium, and so forth, uh, remote viewing, what have you. And but one of the methods that he had in there on how to communicate with the dead was using a manual sweep radio. And if you think about, like, for example, uh, these old uh, radios that had a dial on them, and you turn the dial and it, and it goes through the stations, and you can actually hear it going through the stations. Or if you remember back in the old days in the 60s when you had a, a car radio, when you would turn the dial, you could hear it going through the stations. It's basically like that type of a noise. And he had a process where, you know, you turn the dial and you listen for the voices coming through the dial and he would ask questions and so forth. So um, back then, I really didn't know what I was doing, you know, like I do now. So I just turned the radio on and I started turning the dials and asking questions, trying to reach my father, you know, and I had, didn't even make an appointment with him, you know, mm-hmm. like I do today. Mm-hmm. And I got some voices, but I really wasn't satisfied with it. So um, 
I quit using it, and about a year later, I was watching uh, that television show, Paranormal State, uh, with Ryan Buell, and um, they had a um, show, they were talking about this, uh, it was the episode about the asylum, and on that show, they had Christopher Moon, Christopher Moon is a paranormal investigator, and he was testing the controversial Frank's box. And basically what it is, it's a radio, a homemade radio built by a man named Frank Sumpton of Littleton, Colorado. And um, Frank builds him right from the ground up, and he goes to Radio Shack, and he buys all the spare radio parts and puts all the stuff together, solders them up and so forth. And he built this radio that sweeps through the stations, uh, unmuted, so you can hear all the noise as it goes through the stations. And somehow the dead talk to you through that noise. I think it's like white noise. Remember the movie White Noise? They speak to you through that noise. And um, Christopher Moon was testing that box. And I watched the show, and I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's something I could do, you know, with a radio, right? I don't have any psychic abilities, right? So I don't need to be a psychic or a medium. So I contacted the show, and uh, and I found out who Frank, Frank something was and how to get in touch with him. And um, I sent him an email, and I told him, you know, that I saw the show, what I wanted to do. And he told me that he would be glad to send the plans, the design plans on how to build the radio Frank's box. But I said, Frank, I don't even know anything about electronics. I don't even know how to do any electronics work. I says, is there, any, is there another way? So Frank told me, he says, yes, there is another way. He says, go to Radio Shack and buy this model radio, the Model 12-469 radio, $25 radio. And he says, and then go out to YouTube. And on YouTube, there's a man by the name of uh, <clears throat> Mike Coletta who creates these um, videos. Mike Coletta runs a website out there called ufogeek.com. And Mike has these step-by-step uh, -step videos on YouTube that teaches you how to take these radios apart and how to cut the mute, the mute pin, or sometimes it's a mute wire depending on the model. And when you cut that pin, it allows the radio to sweep through the stations or scan the stations unmuted. Okay? So he told me to do that, and then he says, and then what I want you to do is I want you to join my, my website on Yahoo called EDP ITC Group. And uh, there's a bunch of guys there, myself, uh, uh, Bruce Holliday, uh, Steve Holte of Keyport Paranormal, and we'll, we'll teach you how to do this. We'll teach you how to make contact and so forth. So I did everything he told me to do, and um, I joined the group, and, you know, I got with the guys, and they told me, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, they says, unlike what you hear on television, you don't have to go to a haunted location to make contact with the dead. You can do it in your own home. The dead are everywhere, they told me. I says, okay. They says, when you, when you get home, in your home or wherever you're going to do this, um, make sure you turn your recorder on first to record because as soon as you turn that radio on, you might get a message, and if you don't, it's just going to be another fish story, right? So I set this all up in my room. I have an office here that I work from because at the time I was working from home. And as soon as I turned, you know, I turned the recorder on, as soon as I turned that radio on and set it to scan, I got a voice that came out real time that says, Mike Edwards, and I totally flipped out. And I said, oh, my God, who are you that called me? And what happened is uh, later on when I went to listen to the messages, there was actually a, a lower-sounding message that wasn't real-time. And when I say real-time, real-time means you can hear it during the session. When I had asked, you know, who's calling me, there was a lower-sounding message that I could hear on my headphones that said, Christian. I actually have that video on YouTube. But... Since I didn't hear that during the session, I kept asking. This is, who are you that called me? And when I asked it the second time, I got a message real time that says, hello, Michael. <laughs> it just totally blew me away. And, I, you know, when I'm sitting here in my house, which is, you know, like 10 or 12 years old, and it's not haunted, and somebody can see and hear me, and I can't see and hear them. So That's what I did... Funny. Yeah, it was really spooky. So what I did is, um, and I realized it wasn't radio traffic, because I know a lot of people 
and even, even myself, I was kind of skeptical at first before I even did this. You know, is this radio traffic coming through or airline planes going overhead or what have you? But, I mean, you still do hear radio traffic and the noise, but this, this was a voice that was communicating with me. So what I did is I started picking up things off my desk. I picked up a stapler. I says, what is this? Stapler. They said stapler. I picked up uh, the book. I says, what is this book? I had a hat hanging on the wall, and I picked it up. I says, what's this called? A hat. I mean, they, whoever these beings were, whether you want to call them ghosts or spirits or what, they could see and hear me, and I couldn't see and hear them, which was amazing. So um, I, I continued, you know, testing that out, and I started to get used to listening to the different voices because the voices that were coming through, sometimes they were human-sounding, but most of the time they were electronic-sounding or um, or even, uh, you know, like Chip and Dale, you know, cartoon character-type sounding voices would come through. Or if any of you remember or like Peter Frampton, you would hear the voices come through in the music. And um, then I also noticed uh, over time that um, a lot of my peers, when they were doing their recordings, they would focus on those real-time messages. You know, they would continuously post the real-time messages, I got this, I got that. And then I started to realize that there was a lot more messages that were occurring before those real-time messages that people weren't even focusing on. So that's how I sort of started developing my process for the book. I started to realize I've got to I've got to capture everything. You know, I've got to do everything. So what I uh, after I I learned how to listen to the different voices and so forth, and um, then I uh, decided that I was going to start. I, I contacted a friend of mine who was a medium, and I said I really don't know what to do next. You know, I mean, she says why don't you make an appointment with somebody. How about your father? Make an appointment with your dad. Just say the prayer to your um, to him, or uh, he says. You, or she says, "What what faith are you?" He says, "Well, I'm Catholic." And she says, "Well, Catholics have they believe it that every person is born with a guardian angel." And I says, "That's true, because I always do talk to my guardian angel since I was in the first grade, and that's told me I always had one." So what I did is I said, "Guardian angel, angel, can you uh, invite my father?" to come here on a set day and time. And um, I couldn't get in touch with my dad. This is, uh, I started doing it around probably eight, April 2008. I couldn't get in touch with him. I just couldn't get him to come through. So anyways, while I was frustrated doing that, this person that I was telling you about that was a medium, she's also a former Chicago police officer. And um, she said, well, she says, maybe, you know, there's a reason for it. She says, but... In the meantime, she says, I'm working a case in your state, North Carolina, a missing teen case. She said, would you be willing to help me out with it? You know, I'll do the remote viewing of uh, different areas that they want me to look at. She said, I'm working with a provider and investigator, and, um, and then you can record to get information. I said, okay, I'll try. And... Um, we were working uh, with this team on the last scene location where he was last seen. And what it was, it was a, a boat in town. You there? I am now. Uh, something happened. Like, I don't know if Skype just winked out on us momentarily or what. You still on, though? Yeah, I'm still on. It's, okay. Let me double check. So make sure, show? Let me double check and make sure that's still live. <laughs> well... I uh, show that we're still live. Okay, that's good. So anyways, we started focusing on the last scene location, which was a bait and tackle store. And behind the bait and tackle store were two ponds of water. And um, what we were looking for was we knew the boy was dead because one of his friends told the police he, were, he had been killed. But then when they tried to question him further, he got a lawyer and he wouldn't talk anymore. So the police knew he was dead. But when we got involved with this, it was already a cold case file, so we were working with a private investigator. And um, so we started recording for that area. We're trying to look for his car and also for him. And um, we kept saying, you know, I kept saying in the recordings, are you, are you, are you, are you, where's your body? You know, is it on land or is it in water? And I got messages that said water. 
um, and so forth. And um, then we started focusing on the two ponds back there. And I says, well, is your body and car, is it in the, you know, little pond or the big pond? We got a message that said real time, but little. And then, um, so, um, this friend of mine, the medium, she said, well, let me talk to the investigator because, you know, this area we understand has never been searched because when they're, when they were looking for the boy, the weather got bad and they never searched that area. So what they did is they got an investigation team to get permission to go on the land and they went around the, we were, and we were, I was also getting, a, I forgot to tell you this, I was also getting messages from the boy. He kept saying the word receipts. He would say receipts. Receipts, and this is what was coming through in real time. We couldn't figure out what that meant. So anyways, when the investigation team went in there, and they went looking around the little pond, they found a bag of receipts. And in the bag of receipts, they, they belonged to the boy. They were his. And then also they found a, uh, a diary that belonged to his girlfriend. And uh, the receipts were for purchases of uh, new tires. And... Um, they found the tires strewn about the banks of the of the pond. So what they did is they went in there and they uh, they drained the pond. They found his leather jacket, a gun with a serial number scratched off, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but they never found the car or the body. That was they found they actually found the body about ten miles away um, on, on a farm. But even just to get that information. Um, you know, from a deceased person was truly amazing. Oh, I would tend to agree. A lot of things in your book I thought was truly amazing because there's so much, and I'm I, sorry to interrupt you, but there's so much uh, controversy out there about um, the old um, recording method to just record and play back EVPs later and the validity of that. And there's so much um, controversy about the validity of... Uh, you know, paranormal phenomena about ghosts and whether or not they're real. And a lot of the stuff you put in this book uh, would indicate to anybody that was actually present with you when you were doing this that there could be no way that there's not something real going on. Otherwise, how can you have a, like, a live conversation going on? Yeah, and, th and that's what's really amazing, Um that you could have that. And again, whoever, you know, whoever's listening now, whether you're a, a paranormal investigator that currently uses Radio Sweep or, or not, or you're a weekend enthusiast, paranormal, um, if, if you're going to start out, if you're a newcomer, you're going to start out, the best place to start out, especially, you know, I'm sure you're going to be skeptical of it because you're using a radio, right? Is this radio traffic? The best place to start out if you read my book, is the show and they tell process. And that's basically what I described to you earlier. You pick up items and you ask them to tell you what it is. Once you start getting your answers, you're going to realize, gosh, somebody can see and hear me and I can't see them. Then you're going to know there's something real going on because you're you're getting direct answers to your questions. And then, then from there, you go and you learn how to listen to the different voices. You learn how to try to figure out what is radio traffic versus, you know, kind of normal, and so forth. Once you learn that, then you can go to the other session types, you know, where you want to record with your loved one that passed away or, or somebody else's loved one. Or you could do, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're a police officer, for example, and you want to record crime cases to, to with, with, a, with a deceased victim to try to get more information, you could do that. Or, um, or, or you could take it on your paranormal investigations with you and do it. Um, like I remember, uh, I, uh, had actually had joined a group here in North Carolina, the Carolina Hauntings, uh, and Research Society. And, um, they, they actually let me bring my radio street device with me on a couple of investigations. And one of them was at Ferry Plantation Home in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And, um, this was, and still is a very amazing place. If any of you out there get the chance to go there, they will actually let you go in there and stay overnight. They'll they'll put a, um, the manager in there to stay in with you overnight, and um, they usually charge about fifteen fifteen bucks a person, and um, so forth. 
uh, we went in there with a radio sweep device, and uh, there was we had a group of 16 people, so we split up in eight groups of eight, and some of us went upstairs and some of us went downstairs. The group that I was with, um, what we did is we we were asking the dead to name us, and they named us. And we had people with unique names. We had a girl named Tiki and another guy named Boris, and they named them, which was totally amazing. We also had a girl there. This was her first time going on an investigation, and she was pregnant. And she asked um, she asked them, what kind of um, child am I going to have, a boy or a girl? We got a loud message that said, girl. Yeah. And when we got with her, you know, much later, um, talked to her. She said she did have a girl. She didn't even know. She had no idea what she was going to have. But we also had, there was a tree out back um, of the plantation where they used to hang the slaves. And we went out there and we asked them, you know, what happened to the slaves back here? And somebody said they hung them. Um, I got that on a YouTube video. You can actually hear that. Um, and then we, you know, we would ask questions like, can you count us? And they counted us as, you know, as a group of eight. And, uh, I jokingly said to, to one, to, you know, I says, you know, how many of you are in here, uh, died? Or, or something like that. How many of you are dead? Or, or how many dead are in here with us? I think the way they phrased the question, how many dead are in the room with us? And we got a message real time said, all of us. You know, which made us all laugh. But what we did in that house also is every room we went in the house, we would ask the same questions, and we were pretty much getting the same answers. And what we did initially right from the start is we asked them, you know, what kind of, what's your favorite holiday? And they kept saying Christmas. So when we were toward the end of the investigation, um, I asked them, I says, why do you like Christmas so much? And we got a real-time voice that said, because of the presents. And uh, so I said, this is really amazing stuff that you can get going on in these investigations. And what's really nice about this is really think about if you're a paranormal investigator and you're one today that uses the traditional recorder-only process where you go from room to room and you all sit there and you ask questions, but you don't hear anything because you can't hear anything until after the investigation's over. After you've already left the residence, that's when you go back and listen to everything you've got. Using Radio Sweep, you can actually often get real-time messages and then you can interact with them. And if you read my book and follow my process, you can also uh, capture all those messages that occur before and after the real-time messages and learn a lot more about that house and location that you're investigating than you would yes, with and the it, traditional it, recorder-only process. If you'll pardon my interrupting here, I wanted to point out for those people listening that when I was reading your book, I noticed that you gave detailed examples of how this... Um, you know, before and after listening made a difference, you know, and, you know, because of some of these stuff that was too low to be picked up, you know, with the regular noise and how you could go back and listen to it later. I wanted everybody to know you gave de- very detailed examples of this that would really help people understand it. Yeah. But, no, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty amazing, and... um but I know there are there are people I I've met people within the paranormal community or part of the paranormal investigative community that do not believe in radio sweep um for whatever reason. Um they often they think it's radio traffic pretty much all the time. But I think the the key the key thing that I want to point out to if there is anyone on the call listening uh, that's in that category where you don't believe it, you believe it's radio traffic. It, the best place for you to test it out for yourselves, to be sure, is use the show and they tell process. If you use that process when you go on your investigation and you ask them questions, you know, t- tell me what this is, or even do, um, we had a girl in my group, uh, I had run a group on Facebook called uh, the Worldwide Radio Sweep Ghost Box BVP Alliance. She actually was doing some recordings uh, last week where she would just say, what is 2 plus 2? And they were saying four. You know, what is three plus three? Six. So they, she was actually testing them. And another thing she did is she was testing them with nursery rhymes. You know, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very, and then she would stop. 
and then she would get a message, shiny nose. So, you know, she was doing all kinds of really neat testing to get them to answer it. Okay. Now, real quick, like, let me intercede here because um, one of the people that's uh, co-hosting with me tonight, and I think it's both of them, but I know one of them for a fact, has exhibited a real interest in these similar devices to me in the past, and he has a ghost hunting team of his own, and I'm pretty sure that he's got some questions that I want to make sure he gets a chance to ask. So, John, I think you know I'm referring to you, don't you? Yeah, Roy, so I figured that out. Uh, first, to uh, let uh, Edward know, uh, Gerald and I both have been to some of the Chris Moon classes that you talked about, and we've seen demonstrations of the ghost box. And actually, he's done a personal one for me, and he's done one for one of my team members, too. So we're very much familiar with that. Also, one of the things that we did not used to do was listen in real time, even when we're using a recorder out in the field. We started putting headsets on the recorders and letting somebody monitor while we're going so that if we pick something up that we can hear with our ears across the recorder, we can respond to it. So okay. uh, we have found that to be beneficial, too. I don't know how many people have done that. Uh, you know, We didn't used to do that until about a year and a half ago. So uh, we had just started doing that. Now, I have the same uh, Radio Shack hack you do, that uh, 469. Yeah, I love that radio. Yeah. So anyway, I, that's what I have, too. Now, uh, like you say in your book, the clicking noise is a little irritating. It, I, I find that the clicking noise is less on the FM frequency than on the AM, and I notice you like to stay on AM uh, for your area. Yeah, I pretty much, um, uh, when I use that radio, um, if I'm doing it myself, I'll keep it on AM, but when I record for clients, um, I'll keep it on FM because the clients just can't deal with the clicking noise. And when you think about noise, too, okay, and you, whether it's the clicking noise on AM, and this is just for this particular model radio, by the way, everybody, um, but also even on the FM, there's still noise, right? And one of the things that I tell my clients to do, and I'm sure you, you understand this yourself, is uh, when you're listening for messages that's coming through that noise, what you have to think about is you, you, you want to listen for words, short phrases and sentences within the noise. So think of yourself, you're in your family room, you're watching a football game, and uh, you're trying to listen to the game, your wife comes in with some of her friends or your children come in and they start talking behind you and start banging pots and pans and doing all kinds of things, and now you can't hear the game, right, because you hear all that noise. So in order to hear the words, okay, coming through that uh, the radio, the uh, sportscaster, what have you, you block out in your mind all that noise so you can hear those words. And that's what you need to do with Radio Sweep. When you're listening to it, you've got to block out the noise, all that background static and so forth noise, and listen for words, words, short phrases, and sentences. And that's the same thing when you do your transcription. When you put your headphones on and you're listening to it and you're trying to listen to your files, you want to listen for the words. Well, that was another thing that I found interesting about your work is that you do do the transcription, and I don't know how much time you spend doing that. We haven't done that ourselves. We have pulled out the phrases like you talk about, you know, where we have the question and the answer, and we leave mm -hmm. that. Uh, normally, we leave that in an MP3 file uh, to get to the class so they can play it on most anything, and I, I notice that you like different files for different reasons, uh, and, and I am aware of, of your reasoning behind some of that. Yeah, one of the things that I do, and of course this took over two years for me to develop, okay, because I, you know, especially to try to get some idea of what's really going on here and to document it. Of course, you know, at IBM I write education documents, so I'm really into writing, and you know, I use the Microsoft spreadsheets a lot at work and so forth, and it's a good way to show something and, and explain it out, especially if you're going to explain it to your client, whether it's a client that you're recording for a loved one or whether it's your client that you're doing an investigation for. What you have here is a nice process. And this is the complaint that I've gotten from some of the paranormal investigators that I've talked to. They says, well, how do we, we can't explain this to our, our client that we're doing the investigation for, how we got these messages out of all this noise, which does have radio traffic in it. 
And, and basically the way I designed it is when you go into that house, you have to have a method of how you're going to record. And so basically I, I set it up to where I know that when I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to allow the allotted time, whatever that is, for them to answer, and then I'm going to say the word okay. So let's say I ask five questions. Every time I have, when I'm listening to that entire clip, I'm going to go through it, and where I hear the word okay, I'm going to slice that out, save it as one. I'll have five files now. But the okay is where I know my, my stopping point is, so I can slice it out. And then when I go back and I listen to for the messages, I'm going to listen for any immediate response from my question, right? So what I'll do is I'll slice that out, the question, the answer, save it as 1A, and then I'll go back into the file again, delete out what I just saved, start to listen for some more messages. Let's say with that one particular file, I might have 1A, B, C, D, E, and each one of those files has paranormal message or has messages on them. And, and what I like to call them initially is I call them all suspect paranormal because what I do is I make sure there's no radio traffic in there. It's not a 100% guarantee, but I know I do the best that I can to ensure there's no radio traffic in those recordings. And it's just suspect paranormal messages. <clears throat> when they become paranormal, if, if I'm recording for a client, let's say a client who had a loved one that died, when they review the material, they say, yeah, this is real, this is real, then each one of those suspect paranormals gets recategorized as paranormal. And then anything left over is uh, still suspect paranormal. Now, let me give you an example of what happened to me with one, with one client. <clears throat> you know, she went through and she identified all these things. A lot of the stuff moved from suspect paranormal to paranormal. But there was one there that said, um, it said, uh, I saw Paul got in trouble, said a girl had big boots. The client says, I don't have anybody in my family named Paul. You know, so she completely discluded that. But a week later, she came back to me. And this is what I was recording with her mother. And uh, this woman had gotten married, had children after her mother had already died. So anyways, uh, she came back to me a week later. She said, I talked to no one in my family. She says, you know what? I realized that my son... Uh, my son got in trouble in kindergarten for telling a girl or making a comment about a girl's breasts. She says that my son's middle name is Paul. Michael, uh, Michael Paul, um, Michaels. So now she moved that suspect paranormal message recategorized to paranormal now. But this is something that you guys can use, you as paranormal investigators out there that are going into these locations. You can use this process. You can explain it to your clients how you came to the conclusion of getting these messages. And then, by, because the process also ensures you keep the original file, if they want to go back to the original file, see where that message occurred, you can show them. John? Well, I'm wondering about how much time you spend doing that because I know that on, in our process, uh, the way we do things, we really haven't been using the, the sweep radio as much as uh, we could be using it. In fact, we're trying to start using it more. We've got more people interested in it than we used to have, and so mm -hmm. we're trying to get um, more back to using it. I've always used dousing rods. I've been a dowser for over 40 years, so I can get some similar results. Uh, you know, using dousing rods just by asking yes and no questions. And that's always been easy for me. But uh, we're trying to get back to where we're using uh, the sweep radio and trying to do this. But we also find that we have limited time in trying to, to pull these out. Another interesting thing we've had happen is sometimes when we're sitting there listening to a file, we hear it when we're in a client's house and we pack up and we go home. And even though we play it several times to the client right there while we're there, we go home and it's it's gone. Yeah, that is odd. Have you had that happen? No, no. I've talked to a couple other groups that have had similar things happen where files just they hear it while they're there, and as they are when they get home, they don't have it anymore. No. Just, I don't know what it is. That's interesting, though, yeah. 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, you might keep your, you know, keep an eye out, and if you find something, please let me know because I'm curious as to what's going on there. Yeah, I, I'm kind yeah. of wondering if you know the entities aren't there listening as you're going over it, and they are, are putting the input back out there where you hear it again, you know, every time you play it. But then when you get home, it's not there. Uh, you know, that's the only explanation I can come up with. Wow, that's the, I've never heard of that before. Yeah, so it, it's something that we've run into on more than one occasion. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add into that, John? No, I'm good on that. Uh, I, I don't know. Gerald may have some questions he wants to ask right now. Gerald? Um, well, I, I I basically want to speak from experience. It's not really a question. Okay. Uh, very recently, and you and I discussed this prior to, before we coming on, you know, for coming on to the air. Um, you know, we had talked about a private session that was done with uh, John and 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 Javan, and uh, I, you know, I heard the voices come over, man, and you know, the question was asked about heaven. Uh, I believe Shavan asked if heaven was real, and the voice came back and said, "Yes, heaven's real. It's like virtual reality, the way they perceive us, you know." So um, I found that just very interesting in everything, and. My question is, is Michael, have you come across situations like that where they try to describe the afterlife as far as, have you ever heard the phrase, it's like virtual reality? I've gotten, uh, um, every time I ask my dad what's happening, like, he won't tell me. He, he he tells me what he wants to tell me. You know, he's just very stubborn about it. But when I've recorded for other, for other clients, often I'll ask them myself, you know, I'll ask them what's happening like. And I, I did this um, recording with a drowning victim, and uh, she was a teenager. And um, I asked her what heaven was like, and um, she said, it's awesome. She says, they have so much food here. <laughs> Apparently, she liked to eat. <laughs> and she went on and on about the food and how beautiful it was. And she said, and my grandmother has her own place, and they're going to give me my own place soon to live. I mean, it was it was. The way she described it was like it was a parallel universe, like another Earth um, that they were living in, and that they could eat and drink there. Because uh, there was another client that I asked her, you know, what heaven was like, and she was telling me they have the best wines and uh, best food, and so that's the impression I got from 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 different you know times that I've asked. Um, it's in, and like my dad, I remember uh, I was recording with him and my my uncle, and um, they uh, I asked his daddy, "Are you here?" And they, and my uncle, because um, he has a, he actually when they do record, most of the times you really can't tell uh, it, it it really doesn't come through the same voice that they had when they were alive, but for some reason my uncle when he talks he has that real long southern drawl accent that he had when he was alive. And he made a comment that we we flew in over your house, <laughs> so they gave me the impression that they can fly, you know. And then there was another woman who she died in her bedroom with all of her sisters there. And she she described when she died, uh, the angels came and got her, and they flew out of her house, and they flew over her farm, and she could see the deer in the field when they were flying away, and. It's just uh, amazing stuff, but that's the impression I get is that they have um, a very similar world. Like my dad told me, he lives with his family. Um, he's got uh, 15 brothers and sisters, and of course they're all dead now. They're all there now, grandparents. But um, but it's just amazing. I mean, you know, initially initially when I first started doing this, I kept thinking, you know. I don't know if you, you guys know, you, you hear about the, you know, the police officers, right? The police officers have that in, interrogation room, right? The glass window, and they're watching the guy being interrogated or girl being interrogated. I always initially thought when I first started doing this, that maybe that's how they see us. Maybe they're in some kind of a room, and they're looking at us, and they're watching us, some kind of a portal or window, what have you. But that all changed when uh, I got a recording. Uh, this is after my son. He was in his first year in college. And uh, I got a message from my dad, and it said I was sitting inside Patrick's car, and he got pulled 
uh, by the police, and they let him go. So I told my wife about it, and um, she asked my son um, about it, and he said he got pulled over by an undercover detective for street racing, and they let him go with a warning. So it made me realize that my dad was in that car with him. So it's not a portal. They're actually really here. How they get here is mm -hmm. another story. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in answer to uh, what Carol is saying too in the chat room, Royce, uh, I think that heaven is different for everyone because one person's heaven is another person's hell. Let's face it. And uh, Carol has asked here, I wonder if our pets are in heaven waiting for us. And I'm sure Edward's going to tell us that he's had communication with people that have their animals with them. And for All some right. I said, John, you're reading my mind. I was fixing to ask him the same thing. Uh, when you, uh, some, for some people, uh, if your pets aren't there, it's not going to be heaven for you. You know, so, I mean, your pets have to be there, Carol. Oh, the pets. Okay, let me tell you about the pets. And, I'll, and this is something recently that just happened to me. Uh, it happened to us uh, toward the end of uh, last year. My daughter's cat, Matilda, died. This was her favorite cat. I mean, she's had this cat since 2003. And the, we, my, I actually got up to go to, to go to work, and I found the cat dead in her bedroom. Okay? So I woke my wife up, and I said, what do we do? The cat's dead, you know. And so we, I said, we have to wake her up and tell her, you know. Can't just take it away. So anyways, it was a very emotional situation. And um, um, my wife, um, her grandmother... Uh, was a medium. My wife is Cuban, and her grandmother was a medium in Cuba. She lived to be 100 years old. And she had the ability where she could see and hear spirits, and she had already passed. So anyways, I did a I told my daughter, I said, I'll do a recording, and I'll see how Matilda is. I actually got these uh, on YouTube and out there, the recordings with the cat. And um, I did a recording, and first of all, of course, I asked if her, her grandmother was there. And she says, yes, we're here. And... Um, and I said, you know, where's Matilda? And they said, I got a message that says she's downstairs with Mary. And my daughter was downstairs in the kitchen eating. And then uh, we had another cat that had died previously to that named Butterscotch. And I said, uh, where's Butterscotch? And they said, Butterscotch is downstairs with Mary. And then I asked, you know, if, if the cat Matilda had any, any message for Mary. Now, I don't know if the cat's giving the message or if maybe it's an angel relaying the message. But I asked the cat, you know, do you have a message for Mary? And the message that came through, it says, she's going to miss me. Real clear message, which I got on YouTube. So they do go there. Um, uh, animals do go there. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell, I'll tell you another reason why I know they go there too is, um, I'm not sure if any of you have ever done, uh, used this process that was developed by, uh, <coughs> by Margaret Downey um, called the Watcher Instrumental Transcommunication. It's basically taking a clear glass bowl or dish or a shiny bowl or dish and filling it partway with water three-quarters of the way, stirring it, put it underneath a light source, and take photographs of the water while you're stirring. I've gotten a lot of images of cats and dogs and animals show up in that water, seals, uh, bears, even elephants. So, from my own experience, I know that they, they do go to heaven, and they are there. Okay. Well, I was uh, trying to, a minute ago, put in a little humor, but I thought John make a, made a great point, as do you, about the pets. Um, I thought it was kind of funny that I was just fixing to ask you if you had ever picked up a pet during one of your, um, you know, sessions with the um, box. The um, you know the radios, right? And um, well, he was going in that same direction, so I thought it'd be kind of humorous to say, "Oh, wait a minute, you read my mind. You're breaking in where I was going to go." <laughs> well, I remember right after the other cat, Butterscotch, had died. This was like a couple of weeks afterwards. I was doing a recording with <clears throat> with a client, a client's family member, and a, a message came through and it said, "There's a cat on your lap." So I was thinking about the butterscotch. 
Well, I, I'm thinking other things here too, Royce. I mean, if, if heaven's different for everybody too, I mean, then when you ask somebody over there what heaven is like, how can they tell you? All they can tell you is what it's like for them. They can't tell you what it's like for you. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And I've had guests on, John, that have mentioned that um, in many cases, it's like heaven is tailor-made to the individual. Yeah. You pretty much get what you think you're going to get when you get there, in other words. Right. right. You would have to, or otherwise it wouldn't be worth the effort. You know, uh, God wouldn't have done his job, and, and uh, I'm sure he's done his job thoroughly. In fact, I'm fascinated by the idea, because how can he do that for so many people and wedge all these things together where they work uh, in a cohesive manner without disrupting somebody else's heaven. Right. Well, one of the things, though, John, I wanted to mention while we still had time in the show, I don't want to let this guy get away, is because one of his chapters at the very back of the book is devoted to this, and I think he makes a lot of excellent points, and that's the fact of how many different uses you can use these radio boxes for and I thought you might like to tell us a little something about that, uh, Mike. Right. That's a, that's a very good point to make. Um, <clears throat> and that's um, that's an interesting thing because when you really think about this, okay, for those of us that do use it, some of us are just weekend enthusiasts, we go to cemeteries or we go to haunted places or what have you. A lot of us use it in our investigations, going into clients' homes or businesses and try to find out what's going on and so forth. Um, but if you really think about, if you, if you try to think about, well, what can we use it beyond that, okay? Um, okay, a, a good example, um, police officer trying to find uh, how this, this crime victim died. Um, you can record with that crime victim that died and try to get information from the crime victim. Or well, let's say you have a missing child that has not been found yet, Okay. Now, based on what we know, or at least what I've learned anyways, is I know the dad can see and hear me. I know they can. Okay? So let's say a child goes missing. If their grandparents are dead, you know that grandparents is going to be watching over that child. So you would want to record with them and try to get information from them what happened to the child. So a police officer could do that. And the reason why I keep saying police officer is initially... As you know, and I showed you that case that I got involved with. I think from experience, it's better if you, if you're, if you're an officer, that you do this yourself rather than have a person like me, who's not a police officer, do it. Because police officers, uh, law enforcement officers, have access to information that myself I do not have access to. So they may already know a lot of the stuff that I'm getting. It's stuff that they haven't released to the public. So they have the little puzzle board that they're working. They're trying to fill in the puzzle pieces. So they know what questions to ask. So it'd be better if they recorded it. And also if they got something that, you know, was really gory, you don't want to give that to a family member. And, and here's another reason why. And this is, this is very important because I've actually recorded, uh, this is, I don't record, uh, I, I try to stay away from crime cases anymore unless it's with an investigator or a police officer. But I've actually got a wrong information for crime cases. And I, the only thing I can attribute that to is spirits are giving me wrong information. So I may not have reached the uh, relatives that were dead or I may not have reached the victim that was dead. Somebody else gave me wrong information. So if you really think about it, if you're not a police officer and you're out there just trying to help out on a crime case and you get information and let's say it gives information about death, what have you, and you give that to the family member that could really destroy them. So I recommend if you're, if you're going to record crime cases, make sure you're at least a law enforcement officer or you're working with a police officer. Because remember, if you're working for a police officer or an investigator, they're not going to give that information to the family member. Okay? <clears throat> but uh, so think of the, the, this device as a tool, okay? Now, and then we, I actually tried this with a group of us. This was... Um, I think it was, I think it was in 2009 we did this. A bunch of us, this is why I still have my Yahoo group, um, we got an idea of trying to use it as a tool. 
So we 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 thought, well, let's let's see if we can you know try to find a cure for a disease. Okay, now we're not doctors, right? We, we don't know anything about medical information, what have you, but we figured we'd try it anyways. So um, I had met this guy at a party, and um, he told me that he was a cancer researcher at Duke University uh, Hospital, and he was doing cancer research on melanoma cancer, and they were trying to f- find this uh, particular uh, solution to um, to solve a problem they were doing with, with, their, with their research. So he um, he gave me a couple of questions to ask. He says, I don't really believe in this, but I, you know, I'll give you a couple of questions to ask and see what you get. And um, so we took those questions and we uh, I gave them out to our group and we all, on different days, we recorded with a, re- a deceased and renowned uh, cancer researcher uh, to try to get the information uh, for this uh, the, the living researcher, and um, only one of us actually got a term, a medical term, that through listening to it phonetically, we were able to go out to Google, Google and it was actually associated with uh, melanoma cancer research. But what we realized from this experience is we were the wrong people doing the recording. It should have been a cancer researcher. Why? Because there's a lot of medical terminology that none of us would recognize because it's not part of our everyday English language. So we could have missed a lot of information because we didn't, it's not the language that we hear every day. So uh, we realized from that experience. But also it could be used for, there's, there's a group out there today called the Futurists. And what the Futurists do is they engage in a lot of remote viewing to try to learn about new technologies and um, that they can uh, give to companies and corporations that they work for, they could use this device with the, with, with the belief that the dead know the answers to a lot of our questions, unanswered questions. They could use this device to try to get um, information about new technologies, what have you. <clears throat> you know, engineers uh, could try to get solutions to problems that they have uh, recording with deceased and renowned engineers. Um, again, with the understanding, and if you think about it, where do a lot of our inventions come from? Um, could, do they come from thoughts maybe from the other side? Um, but I think that's what we should be moving towards is try to, you know, because I know there's, there's a lot of focus on, well, is this real or is not real? Um, when they start off with a show and they saw a process and you realize there's something really going on here, I think people should really take this process and move forward and try to use it as a tool and try to get information. Now, one of the things that I'm going to be trying this year, um, as soon as I get caught up on my client recordings, is I came up with this idea, and, and this is a, a question I'm going to ask, is I've, I've actually found on Google a deceased, renowned, uh, Egyptian archaeologist that died in 1925. And I'm going to record with him, and I'm going to ask him who built the pyramids. Let's see what I get. So there's a lot of information we can learn uh, and, and use this as a tool. You know, for those of us in our fields, we're trying to solve problems. Um, and I think that it's important that to get the word out about Radio Sweep and get people out there testing it and using it. I think that's a very good point. You know, John, I was just listening to him, and I had another question come to mind. I almost want to ask you, Mike, have you ever, or do you know of anybody who has ever attempted to call forth a spirit from ancient times, like the back in the times of the building of the Pharaoh or the back in the Sumerian days? And if so, did they have any success? I've actually, well, I've actually... um Myself, I've recorded with Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I actually got messages back from them. Now, I remember about that part in your book, and I was fixing to come to that. But yeah. uh, what I'm talking about is, like, still 4,000 years further back. Uh, no, I don't know anybody that's gone that far. And yet, that's, a good, that's, a good, that's a good question, because you think to yourself, okay, how long do we stay in the spirit world before we reincarnate? 
And how many people have uh, reincarnated and went back to the spirit world after another lifetime? Like, say, somebody just lived a lifetime now that was had been reincarnating down through the millennia, and now they passed away and they're waiting to reincarnate again. And while they're on the other side, they have all this knowledge. Right. That would be interesting to go back that far, even to ask uh, do a recording with Herod. I think it would be something that would be worth experimenting with, even if you don't get anything out of it. I mean, it's bound to do something for your curiosity. Or even Julius Caesar, you know. Or <laughs> that's, a good, that's, a good, that's a good idea. I never even thought about that. Hmm. Or, or what if, even though you had multiple lives, each of your individual souls from those lives are living individually separate from you? Possibility, I suppose. Right. I've heard tell of that before. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is. One thing I do know is I've been sitting here kind of doing Mike a disservice because we've been here all this here time. And aside from when we first started, although I've mentioned his book, I have yet to mention. I was so wrapped up in our conversation. He's so interesting that I forgot to mention where you can get his book. And right now, if you scroll down under his description, you'll see that I have a book cover linked to Amazon where you can buy it at, and um, it'll be up in the archives at this site and at my other radio site uh, probably tomorrow or the next day after I get to converting this into a video. And uh, you also can just uh, Google Speaking to the Dead with Radios by Michael Hobart Edwards, and that will also get you to his Amazon page. And I'm pretty sure, Michael, you've got links somewhere to it as well, don't you? Yeah. Yep. Well, real quick, why don't you tell us where they, uh, you know, of they uh, can get the link at, and about your Yahoo group and your Facebook page. Yeah, the, uh, the Yahoo, um, the Yahoo group right now that I have, um, it's called uh, Speaking to the Dead with Radios. I have it set up out there for my clients and so forth to go out there, or for prospective clients to go out there and listen to recordings. But uh, right now, uh, I manage a group on Facebook called the Worldwide Radio Sweep Ghost Box EVP Alliance. And basically what this group is, it's people all over the world that use uh, Radio Sweep. We all share our recordings and processes with each other. And also, we share what radios can be hacked or taken apart and made usable as a ghost box in the different countries and so forth. So it's a really good group. If you want to join uh, to learn about different practices and different radios you can use and even where to get the radios today um, to use and so forth. There's also a couple of my members that actually build homemade radios, uh, Steve Holte of Keyport Paranormal and Joe Chiappi, C-I-O-P-P-I. He builds the Joe's Box uh, radios and so forth. And also, there's also another gentleman, Gary Galka, He's the one who built the uh, the spirit box. So oh. Yeah, I remember, I think you mentioned that in your book. And you were also mentioning what you were just talking about in your book and the importance of having a place that, um, you know, people that are in other countries that don't have the same access we do can learn where they, where they can find it on our end of the world. And I, I think you're right. I think it serves a great purpose. And that was one of the things I did notice in your book all the way throughout it was you were interested in helping everybody else with any needs they might have in regard to this, uh, you know, ghost sweeping. or um, Right. I mean, in my book, I've even got uh, links to where you can contact Steve Holte of Keyport Paranormal. Steve has an excellent web page of all the different radios that he's actually hacked and taken apart, and Steve is actually building radios now. There's another gentleman... Um, uh, Frank uh, Sumpton, also, he builds the homemade radios as well. And then um, <clears throat> there's Bruce Halliday of uh, Inside the Box Ghost Box Research. He uh, actually hacks radios as well and provides guidance and so forth. I mean, a lot of great guys out there um, that were willing to share information and help you out. Of course, in my worldwide group, we've got other members over in the U.K., and Australia and so forth and different countries in South America um, that are doing this as well that would share information. Right. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just them that you mentioned in your book with links. I noticed when I was reading that every person you mentioned in this book 
that you talked about, like in the history and everywhere else, you uh, you put a link to where everybody could be found exactly. all throughout the that. book. I mean, this book's just shock full of links. And not only did you do it for uh, people that were involved in this, but like when you were telling your stories in the last chapter, you linked to places that had historical information about the place that was being investigated as well. Exactly. So, I mean, yep. I don't think a person could have possibly been more thorough than what you've been in this here book. And I was noticing it the whole time I was reading it, and I was like, man, this guy, he really, he doesn't uh, leave any stones unturned. <laughs> Thanks. But, yeah, yes, it's very, very impressive work. And I'm sorry, John, I didn't mean to talk over you. No problem. Uh, I agree with you, Royce. It's a very good book. I enjoyed reading it very much, even though I haven't finished it. I'm going to finish it. But I had the uh, the Kindle version, and, and when you match the links, you go there. <laughs> it takes a little oh, long. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I have to actually um, type them out since I'm reading it in the paperback. But, uh, hey, that's fine with me. I can type. As a matter of fact, i got my computer set up where I'm sitting in a recliner, so I'm more comfortable while I do it. Okay. I can sit in a recliner with a Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now, was there anything that you would like to tell us about that maybe we haven't thought to mention? Um, I can't think of anything now. I think the only thing that I can really uh, think about, you know, again, and, and it's with the uh, the paranormal investigation groups. Um, you know, when I wrote this book, I wrote it for you know for, for newcomers, pe- people who uh, want to learn how to do it, and also I've given all the links of, of people that can contact to get more information and help and assistance. But also, I wrote it for to make sure I have a step-by-step process, a process that could be used to explain to a client how you came to get and you know, determine that message. And, you know, in laying out in a professional manner and a spreadsheet and so forth uh, for your clients. Because um, I think that's important, especially uh, uh, to, to capture every single message. It's not just the real-time ones. It's those messages that occur before and after the real-time messages. Those are very key. Uh, to understand, um, because it could change the whole message uh, by listening to those uh, than what you originally thought it was. Um, but you also, also gave are, great examples of that in the book too. Yep. Yeah. But um, but also for those of you out there that that are in the paranormal investigation community that do not use Radio Sweep, perhaps because you don't believe in it or, or what have you, I. I beg of you to to read my book. It's uh, what 10.95 for the paper paperback. It's a meal at, at Golden Corral for lunch, um, and you start off first with the show and they tell process. That's where you will realize this is not all radio traffic. That there is something that can see and hear you communicating with you, and then move from there into the different session types. Um, I really hope that. Many of you out there tonight that, again, do not use it, do not believe in it, will at least read this book and try my process. And by the way, you're right. It is ten ninety five at Amazon, which I think is a bargain. And it's even less on Kindle uh, for those that want to get the Kindle version. The only thing about Kindle is, well, you got nothing for your bookshelf. Your bookshelf stays naked. Yeah, I know. I like to give it back. I kind of like to have a book I can go back to my shelf and pull off and, you know, review it later further down the road if I like or if I forget or want to be refreshed, you know, that sort of thing. Not to mention you can share it with friends. Right. I had a friend of mine from the U.K. uh, He sent me uh, an email over the Christmas holidays and had photographs um, of uh, he had bought several copies of my book. And he put them in the stockings over the fireplace. <laughs> Stocking stuffers, he, he labeled the photographs, which I thought was funny. Well, there's a man that definitely liked your book. Yeah. So, was that John I heard in the background just a minute ago? Or was that I've Gerald? A, I've got a clock going off. I can't talk right now. Oh, okay. 
Uh, Gerald, was that you that was fixing to speak a minute ago? Uh, no, but if you don't mind, I would like to ask him a question, though. Sure. Uh, Michael, I know that you had stated earlier that you had talked to Jesus and, and Mary, um, and, and I can imagine when you talked to Jesus that that was somewhat profound because, you know, by you saying that, that, that lets me know that he hears our prayers, you know, when we pray to him and everything. And, and I'm a firm believer, man. I, I just want to clarify that. I straight up believe, you know, God, the whole story. But, uh, I, actually, I actually have those messages on YouTube, and I also have a website, which I didn't give you guys. Um, it's out on in Yahoo. Uh, I have two yet websites where I have those messages posted from Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, let's see if I can find them real quick. Um, also, Royce, you had mentioned you like having paperback because you can share it, right? Right. We can do that with uh, Kindle, too, but, I mean, what about people that ain't online? Yeah, I have a Nook tablet. I'm sorry. I didn't go Nook. I mean, uh, Kindle. I went Nook. I love my Nook tablet. And uh, you can lend it out like you were basically trying to say it. But, um, man, for me, because I'm in a wheelchair, you know, I'm disabled. You know me, Royce, as well as Jeff on this. And, uh, you know, for me, I would love to have a bookshelf full of books. But for me, it's so much more easier just to have it on that new tablet, you know. Hmm. Some people it is. I see uh, people walking around with these here uh, Kindle pads all the time. Yeah. Did you find it, Mike? Oh, I'm looking. Okay. I know I've never actually done any of this here. I have very little experience with this. I'm more into the ancient aliens uh, and uh, ancient religions and mythology and into the UFO than I am into oh, the Oh, UFO. Oh, boy. Oh, I um, have to tell you about that. I did a recording recently, and I actually have those out on YouTube. I did a record. I, I made it through my, through my, through my guardian angel. I did a recording with the aliens that died at Roswell. Oh, re- dude, that would have to be one interesting. Uh, and I recorded with them, and um, I've got some of those re- uh, some of those messages that came through on YouTube. Um, you can hold on one second here. I've got to get. We're not out of time, are we? Well, actually, we're out of time. About seven minutes ago, I was just letting it override. Okay, let me get this. Yeah, the, uh, when we're talking about Jesus, I remember when I recorded with Jesus, um, I asked this Jesus Christ here, and I got a message that said, they came through and said, My Lord, they have come here to meet you. And then um, another message that came through and said, You have great passion. That's what he said to me. He was like, Wow. And, you know, even to, that he would even come and record with me just totally blew me away. I never expected that. Well, to be honest with you, Michael, I would say the way you wrote your book reflects a great passion. I mean, you could tell by the way you worded things and the detail you went to and the links you went to that this is very important to you, and that bespeaks a passion. You're at least passionate about this. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> well, thank you. Let me get the grapes here. I had, what I had to do is I had to sign on to my other ID. Okay, so the group's name is called, this is at Yahoo. So when you go search the Yahoo groups, it's called EVP-ITC-WITH-JESUS-CHRIST. That's the group of Jesus. And then the one with the Blessed Virgin Mary... One of the, the Blessed Virgin Mary is says EVP dash ITC dash messages with Mary. Mm-hmm. 
the Blessed Virgin. So, QDP dash ITC dash messages with Mary, the Blessed Virgin. And those two groups are actually open. You can actually join them and just listen to the messages. Okay. Now, about the uh, link to YouTube where the uh, Roswell extraterrestrials are at, do you have something for that? Or just go to YouTube and look for Mike Hobart. I mean, Mike Edwards. Um, let me get that. See, what happened with see my, my YouTube IT, I, um, they've changed it now to where my ID actually used to be EVPITCSDWR, but now it says Michael Hobart Edwards is the name of my um, channel. So if you go out and look for Michael Hobart Edwards, Cool. Let's see if you can do the search on this. Let's see if it comes up. Yeah, there it is. That's my channel. Yeah, so you go out and you search for Michael Hobart Edwards on Yahoo and I bring up my channel. And I've got the Roswell recordings there right up front because those are the last ones that I did. Oh, cool. <laughs> and when was this? I mean, and I actually have ago. a photograph. When you, um, let's see, I did those three weeks ago. But there's actually a photograph in the video itself. I actually got that using that process that I told you about, the water instrumental transcommunication. Uh, when I did a recording with the, the aliens, I asked one of them to show me what he looked like. And the image showed up in the water of what he looked like. And one of them actually told me what his name was. Now, were you actually uh, asking for spirits of uh, deceased extraterrestrials? Yeah, yeah. What I did is I asked my guardian angel to find uh, alien beings that died in the Roswell crash and asked them if they could come to my home for a recording. And then I just started asking them questions. So this was a deliberate attempt. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it, it was the, the exact aliens from Roswell. We don't know that for sure, but, I mean, I got messages from them. That's still very interesting, especially with all the talk going around the web about the government conspiracy to cover it all up, et cetera. Well, how do we uh, find out more about this experiment, Mike? How would we go about conducting this water sort of thing? On oh, the water instruments of transcommunication? Yeah. Um, Margaret Downey has a site on, on, you can Google her name, Margaret Downey. Okay. She actually developed the process. Okay. And, um, let me see. She's actually been on, um, Mori Povich and so forth. Um, If I can get her site name, ITC, or EVP, okay. Okay, so her group is called, to, to get to her group, it's called itcdeadpeople.com. So www.itcdeadpeople.com. Okay. And that's her group, and she has the process there for water instrumental transcommunication. Okay. That's who I learned from her. Well, this has been a fun uh, radio show. I really enjoyed this. Oh, well, thank you. I've really enjoyed having you on. You, um, you know, had a lot of information to share. Uh, we've actually, I think, covered some ground that hadn't been covered in your book there a couple of times, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, with New Thought. But, uh, hey, a New Thought, I think, is great. Yeah. Uh, my wife was wanting to know if you had any idea what the aliens look like that you were speaking to. I mean, I know this is through Radio Box, but maybe you say... Well, I actually got, an, I got an, a, a photograph of one of them when I used the water when I was doing a recording session. And it's actually on the video. If you go out to my, if you go out to my YouTube page, you see the first video there. You can actually see the alien's face in the water while I'm stirring it. Oh, that sounds cool. So you can actually take a picture of a spirit in the water, then, you think? 
Yeah, that's where the water is to mental trans communication. I've actually gotten images of my father in the water. So, John, have you ever thought of trying that one before? I've never even heard of it before, Royce. But right now, I can tell you, Shavan is really excited. She's going to go to the site right afterwards, and I'm sure we're going to be taking pictures tonight. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys, um, if you guys want to friend me on, on Facebook, uh, I'm speaking to the Dead with Radios on Facebook. I actually have a, about over a hundred photographs that I've taken in the water. I can okay. give you access to my album, and you can look at it. Okay, that's your world uh, uh, Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to, uh, the Worldwide uh, group is just actually a group that I created on Facebook, but my Facebook ID is Speaking to the Dead with Radios. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll definitely do that. Okay. Okay. Now, Mike, does it matter what kind of water you use or what kind of container it's in? Or, I mean, can you run bathtub water and take a picture or sink water and take a picture? You can can use anything. Uh, Now, what I do is uh, I use this clear coinware baking dishes, and uh, I also recently started using the shiny stainless steel uh, pans, frying pans, or dog bowls. Okay. Now, then, does it matter what kind of camera you use? And I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. I used, uh, what I use is just a regular Nikon digital camera. And then also what I did, I just tried recently, is using video. Now, the only problem with using video is you have to look at it frame by frame, and that can take hours. Oh, God. You know, whereas if you take photographs, you just look at the photograph and zoom in on them. But um, so I've actually gotten my daughter's cat, the one that died. Um, I got an image of the cat in the water as well. Okay, uh, back to the camera. I think you said with a Nikon uh, camera. Is that greatly different from a cell phone camera? Um, it's like, you know that guy, that movie star, that, that all the girls liked, the good-looking kid that was married to, uh, what's her name? He, he does those camera commercials. Um, it's one of those kind of cameras. It's, uh, point and shoot, you know. With well, I'm asking, lens. I'm asking because I'm wondering if a, a camera, a cell phone camera, Will work as well as uh, the camera. I'm sure it can. I'm sure it can. And, you know, the key is you, the, the key is you need to put it underneath the light source, so you can so you have a reflection on the water, and you need to treat it at an angle while you're stirring, and the faces show up in that water when it's stirring. Hmm. Okay, so you need the light under it, not over it. No, over it. Over it. Yeah. Directly. So, for over example. It. What I, what I would do is I'll I'll take my uh, bowl and I'll um, stick it on my kitchen table, underneath the, the kitchen lamp there, you know the overhead chandelier. Yeah, I've got a uh, lamp that uh, you set on the desktop, the kind you kind of bend over if you want to, you know, move it over a book or something. That would bring that light just right smack within inches or a foot above the uh, water source. That might do even better. You think? Yeah, you can try that. Yeah, just try different things, whatever works for you. Um, uh, what's amazing, though, it really and truly is amazing what you now, get. That leads me to another question, though. Can you actually call this the spirit you want to take a picture of, or do you have to take random pictures of spirits? Um, most of the stuff that I get are of other spirits. I don't even know who they are. I've actually gotten a plesiosaur or dinosaur in one of my photographs. When you when you friend me on Facebook, you can see it. Plesiosaur dinosaur. Um, I've gotten turtles. I've gotten elephants. Um, a lot of cats and dogs. I've actually gotten deer um, in, in the water images, um, and a lot of different people. Now, the only person that I've actually gotten that I know of is my father. I've got two images of him in the water. And one of my aunts, I got an image of her in the water. So, and the ones you got are the people you know, like your aunt and your father. They just happened to be there randomly. You didn't ask them to meet for the picture. I actually, from from my my dad, he was there randomly. But my aunt, I actually did a recording with her, and she showed up in the water. Ah, so you think maybe if you were to to request uh, 
somebody for a recording, they show up for it, that you can actually get them to pose for the picture in the water? You could. Or have you ever tried? Uh, when I did when I did the recording with the alien, the alien face showed up in the water. Because I asked him to show me his face and, or show me what they look like. Yeah, because I would yeah. personally love to try this out myself right here at home. I think it'd be fascinating. Yeah, That's you can try. I mean, I, it's not guaranteed, but I mean, um, you can try it. What? I know the alien. When I did the recording of the alien, I got the alien's face. Uh, with that, he just showed up on his own when I first started doing it. I was playing around. He showed up, I guess, to, to surprise me. With my aunt, I actually was doing a recording with her, and she showed up in the water. Mm. Well, I got to tell you, it's at least, if nothing else, something to do on a rainy day. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> oh, gosh. You'll get addicted to it. <laughs> oh, I bet we could real quick. I know you can. Now. You really can. Real quick, like, uh, we've overrode about 20 minutes. We're coming up on the half hour mark. I thought I'd ask real quick if John had anything else he wanted to ask or comment on. John, are you with us? Yeah, I had myself muted and the screen went down. It took myself oh. I got Okay. No, I don't have anything else to ask, Royce. I'm in, I'm in good shape, and Shabam's eager to start trying this water thing. Uh, I am, too. And I bet my wife is as well. Very um, little show today. Gerald, what about you? You got something you want to throw in there or comment or just ask? Um, not really. Um, Mike's pretty much covered just about everything that I had questioned. Uh, but I'm willing to try the water thing myself here in a few minutes. <laughs> I am, too. So, you know, that's, that's piqued my curiosity. Uh, it's it's something that, that when I heard him say, I said, I'm going to try that. So um, probably when I get off here, I'm going to have my wife fill up a little dill, three, you know, three-fourths of water, and I'm going to get my camera out, and I'm going to see who I find. Yeah. <laughs> now, that leads to and, and just And just play around with it. Try to get as close as possible as you can, because if you're too far away, Especially if you do video, you can't zoom in on it. But if you're, right. if you have, if you just take the photographs, you can actually zoom in on it pretty good. But it, it, it I, I, I just played around with the, the, the getting close or too close, and once you get to the point where you can see a lot of images, I mean, just just amazing. That I was amazed at all the animals uh, that came through and, and different faces. I even got Civil War type people come through and. Uh, people in period clothing. I got a guy that looked like he was wearing a helmet and he had a sword and with a woman next to him in a long dress. And you know, like I said, when you friend me on Facebook, you can see all the images that I've gotten so far. Cool beans. There's another. There's another individual that does it as well. Um, he, he's from Australia and his name is Orion O R I O N Silver Star, and uh, he does a lot of the water. Um, photography well that's something i can definitely dive into here at home which is good in my condition and i really do appreciate all that info and bearing with me while i was probably sounding like i was giving you the third degree when i was really just trying to learn um but like i said we've got seven minutes remaining uh what about you mike do you have anything else you'd like to throw out there or add to, into this um, not really. I mean, uh, other than, you know, I, I, I would hope that, uh, I think when I look at this process, I think to myself that um, all of us, I think, in, in, on the planet, we're entering a new age. Uh, uh, I think the more connection with the spirit world. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are afraid to do it. Um, but I think it's really important that we do do it. I think it's, especially if I think to myself, if everybody starts uh communicating with their loved ones around the world in different countries. It might even it might even help change the world. It might even help uh, bring about world peace. I mean if especially when you think about the countries and other religions and so forth, there are people that are against everybody. If they got with their loved ones they might get messages to say, Hey, don't act that way. You know, change the way you think and act, you know I think it's important that we 
reconnect and get closer to it because I think what's happened to all of us is we've moved away uh, from the spirit world and I think we need to move mm-hmm. back to it again. And I think through uh, through this type of communication and to really help bring a lot, make a lot of people realize that their loved ones can see and hear them. They are watching over them. There is a place to go to. Their animals are going there as well. So it's, we have something amazing to look forward to. But also, we shouldn't feel the. And, and there's one more thing I want to say. This is really important because this is a lot of what I get in these recordings. Is that Dad always tell me that nobody ever talks to them. So what I tell a lot of my clients is. Even though you can't see and hear them, make an appointment with them. Say a prayer to your, your guide or say a prayer to them and say, hey, can you meet me in my house, in this room, on this day at a set time, and just sit there and talk to them, even though you can't see and hear them, because nobody talks to them when they're gone. And that's one of the big complaints I get from the dead. So that's what I got to say. All righty. Well, Mike, i got to tell you, I've had a fantastic time. You've been a great guest, and I personally want to extend an open door to you along with uh, some of the other fantastic guests I've had over the last six years. Uh love to have you back anytime. Uh, you got my information. Just shoot me an email or send me a Facebook message and let me know you got something you want to come out here and say, and I'll hook you right up. Okay. It's a pleasure uh, talking to all of you, and especially to the audience, even though I uh, I can't see and hear you. It was a pleasure talking to all of you. And you as well. Um, John, uh, Gerald, would you like to say goodnight? Anything y'all want to add real quick, like? I'd like to say goodnight to everybody, and it was a real pleasure to have met you, Mike. Enjoy you. Too. Much. Also, thank Mike, you. I'd like to say thank you for uh, just coming by and talking with us, man. Um, you have really just kept me entertained from the beginning. Um, your um, session with Jesus, I'm very intrigued by, and I'm going to go look for that on YouTube as soon as we're we're done. But I want to thank you for just you know just being here. You know it's it's been an honor, sir, and, and I thank you. All right, thank you. And I want to personally thank everybody out there in Radio Land who's listening for being a participant. I couldn't have a show without listeners, and for my books, if you're listening, that's definite interaction and participation. And once again, you can get his book on Amazon, Speaking to the Dead with Radios. I would really prefer you come by my site and click on his uh, book cover there because, well, I'm being a little shameless here, but I get a commission for everybody, every click that buys the book from my site and goes over to Amazon that way. Uh, but if not, at least go by Amazon and get it because I think you'll be glad you had it. I think you're going to do like his, uh, Mike's friend does use it for stocking stuffers, in fact. Um, Don't forget to tell everybody about the show. If you're listening at YouTube or one of the other video sites or iTunes, please feel free to join over here at ParanormalPalace.com and be with us live. Ask questions in the chat room. Uh, Call in, which I failed to get the call in number earlier, which I should have done, is 832-632-7904. Would love to have you here. We want to build a, a, you know, a listener base up here of people that are interreacting because then you got more questions and it gets more interesting. And I'm going to call it a night with that one. And everybody, y'all enjoy the rest of the week what's left. Don't forget to come see me Saturday at 1 p.m. I'll be talking to Tommy Hawksblood about a new spiritual movement, part two. He's already been here a couple, three weeks ago with part one, and we're going to finish this conversation up. And good night, everybody, and y'all have a blessed uh, week. Okay, good night, everybody, and thank you.